Hi, welcome to Off Script. I'm Zach Lewis. And I'm Dr. Draper. Today on the show, we have a guest. Stacy is joining us. Stacy, welcome to the program. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having uh, me. I met Stacy when we went and saw The Northman with Andy and a few other friends opening night. Uh, Andy turned out so much better than the rest of us. He came all nor <laughs> Northman out. Oh, that, I, uh, I, yeah, I forgot. I, I yeah, was, it was in great. A Viking uh, makeup. Um, mm. which Your really eyes were more. piercing. Every time we looked at you, it's just <laughs> like you were staring through my soul. You had a big scar like Geralt from The Witcher. Like it was good stuff, man. Yeah, yeah. I, was, I was impressed. It was a lot of fun. <sighs> it, it's too bad we can't all know crack crack makeup designers, huh? Like we can't we can't all we That's can't right. all have cool people in our life. But anyway, Stacy came out and joined us. Stacy, how do you and Andy know each other? How'd you get tangled up with the great Dr. Draper? I think it's mutual friends, mainly through Ninfa, but also through uh, Michelle. So I think the origins are an old Reddit group uh, through Dallas. And oh, that's how I yes. made a lot of friends. Um, say, Ninfa has been on the show before as well. It's, Ninfa has been on the show. That's true. Yeah, she's a great guest, friend of the show. Well, thanks for joining us. So you're going to hang out and talk with us about the Northman a little bit. Uh, we need to talk about with CinemaCon. That happened over the weekend and some exciting some exciting announcements coming out of there. Uh, we're going to talk about the unbearable weight of massive talent, the Nicolas Cage picture starring Nick Cage. And before we get to all that, we need to get to the news. And if you're watching on Facebook, you probably saw a little bit of it. But first things first. Wait, wait, wait. The box office. Yeah, go ahead. Go Sorry. ahead. Sorry. Uh, I, I need we'll to mention last week we went to a screening of Scream with uh, Matthew Lillard and oh, Skeet yeah. Ulrich, uh, in yeah, That's right. Yes, uh, you did do that. Do you want to talk about that now or like somewhere in the middle? Like, I'll, you... I'll just do real okay. quick. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it was insane. Like Texas Theater has never been so full. It was completely packed. Uh, they did some Q and A before the before the screening and after, and they were really great with the fans, and people were just like going wild. And it was it was an insane screening because like I couldn't hear the movie half the time because everyone was like quoting along or like yelling when different things happened. Like it was like the wildest fan screening that, uh, I've ever seen. How big was your group that you went with? Uh, it was just four of us. Okay, and they did Q and A after the film, I guess. Both before and after. Oh man, lots of good questions. I mean, how are no. how, how are, no, how are no, Matthew no. Lillard and Skeet Ulrich? Well, uh, so in the, Q &A they're really screen? good. They're really good for like trivia. Like they talk about different things on the. Th but I feel like a lot of times fans have like the worst questions, yeah. or, or just don't really think through them, or it's something really obvious. And most of them, we just wanted to get a picture or, or get like something signed. Like most of them weren't actually questions. They just wanted to kind of meet them. Did you crack one off? Did you get a question in? No, there there was like a line out the door to try and yeah. aunt, ask a question. So. There's no way. Yeah, I, I, I saw when you, you you sent out an invite for that a while back, and I was traveling that weekend, so I couldn't go. But I'm glad you had, glad you all had a good time. Uh, Stacey, did you go? I don't actually. I didn't even ask. No, I didn't. But I, I smile Ooh. fondly because I know how those events at Texas Theater go, uh, especially you know Tuesday night trash when people are just oh, God. heckling the film and yeah. laughing, and the atmosphere is just top notch. So I, I can only imagine what it's like with the. A film screening yeah. like that and, and matthew lillard is like so he's like insanely energetic like the way he is on screen like he's that like that off screen like he was really he was like bouncing around the theater walking around like he wouldn't stay in one place like it was wild that that energy can be infectious i think to a crowd good for him like a, good good for matthew lillard I don't, I don't have any i don't have any sore bones about that guy well good uh, shoot i'm glad you had a good time thanks for reporting i, I completely forgot yes you went to a scream screening that's important uh also we got to get to the news. Uh, in our first bit of news, uh, the the box office is doing some exciting things this weekend. Uh, Bad Guys, the children's film, is doing surprisingly well. Meanwhile, Liam Neeson's got a new movie out. <laughs> Andy, we do a movie podcast. I didn't know Liam Neeson had a new movie out. What is this? Uh, it, it's called Memory, and uh, it, it's another one in the long line of Liam Neeson uh, retired action films uh retiree action films because he's like in his 60s now still doing these action yeah. films uh in this one he he's like uh an assassin or something but he he has dementia or alzheimer's so he's like starting to forget like who he's supposed to kill or it's something like that and it, it has to do with being an assassin who's losing oh, his that's memory. right i think i saw a trailer for that at some point yeah a terrible I... premise is this is is this the death knell for Liam Neeson's action movie star career? Absolutely. I, mean, I, don't, I don't think it needs to be. The guy could just retire out of it. He's like sixty something. I, I, I don't know. Nah, he's gonna keep doing them. He's gonna keep doing them. Sure. He needs like a limited series, right? On like Apple TV Plus. Like give him like eight episodes as like 
I don't know, the equalizer or some kind of hitman or whatever, like the, you know, the, these, these movies as they, as they tend to go. Um, meanwhile, our movie, a, a, everything everywhere all at once is doing surprisingly well, which is surprising. Yeah, well, it yeah, actually uh, it actually had an increase in its box office in its uh, I think it's its third or fourth week, and it had um, I don't know the exact percentage, but it it had a net gain. Uh, yeah, so, so that's continuing to do really good business or have legs for three four weeks now. Yeah, I, I think it cleared thirty million uh, domestic the other day, which does not seem like a lot, but for a twenty four, that's pretty good. That's that's coming up on its two biggest domestic earners, Lady Bird at like forty nine million, and uh, uh, Uncut Gems at like fifty something million. Uncut Gems. Uncut Gems. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, like I, I'm glad it's doing well. It's a surprise. I, I, I you should go. Stacy, have you seen everything ever at once? No, no. Uh, I was invited to see that one with okay. the crew, but that was one of my old lady nights. That's fair. You should you should go soon. I'm it sure people highly, will do that. Like, oh my god, yeah, yeah, highly recommended. Ringing endorsement from your boys at Offscript. Uh, keep it here on Offscript for more from the box office. We'll keep you posted on what's going on next week. And speaking of upcoming films uh the new fast and furious movie has a new director because they lost their old director which is really a bummer for fans of the series uh, justin lynn has exited uh fast x only one week into production leaving universal losing an estimated million dollars per day from a cast and crew that are just sitting around waiting for a director to show up and tell them what to do pretty stunning uh he directed five of these films and kind of was a big part of the reason the Fast and Furious series got back on track from Tokyo Drift. I mean, he uh, kind of introduced the general direction, kind of developed them more into a heist film, and he's worked very closely with the cast and crew up until this film when he suddenly decides he just cannot do it anymore. <laughs> uh, and why is that? <laughs> why is that? Uh, rumors would, would say it's it's because of Vin Diesel, um, because apparently Vin Diesel uh, is showing up to set late, somehow calls the shot. his lines yeah and and he's not showing up uh in shape is is what the rumored uh, quote is from lynn uh and is calling the shots on set uh and he just can't do it anymore so man any any immediate thoughts on fast furious losing their star director i mean they'll probably be okay these films kind of just write and create themselves uh it's it's weird that Vin Diesel has so much like pull in this because like he has no career outside of this franchise and he's pr arguably the worst part of it at this point. Like everyone else is a better actor, better action star. Like, you know, he's like in his mid fifties. He's like, kind of, you know, they, they hide his gut a lot in the movie. They do. Like, yeah. And, and if you're like, I feel like if you're showing up out of shape, like it's not like you're going to get in shape over the next like month that you're shooting or whatever. Uh, yeah, it, it's if you if you saw Fast Nine, you you probably had the some similar experience that Andy and I had. Um, you know, I, I hadn't seen a few Fast and Furious movies, uh, and then I went and saw that one and was very surprised to see Vin Diesel uh, not turning out his best work, man. Like really, really, really really different from the first his first few films when he had, had a much more youthful and vibrant energy and yeah he looks out of shape and he's kind of phoning it in and other actors are just acting circles around him you know like every scene feels like he's he's just a board in the middle of the room and uh it seems like he seems to be the one that's telling people what's what and it's it's wild to think that this series has ended up in this spot obviously it doesn't work with everybody dwayne johnson famously left the fast and furious series uh to make hobbs and shaw which was a spinoff with uh jason statham but he wanted nothing to do with vin diesel couldn't stand working with him on set now justin lynn seems to be uh in a similar camp fortunately they have a new director <laughs> louis 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 letier Le 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 uh, Lata he's, 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 he's he's French, uh, so it's probably Louis. yes. Uh, who's formerly directed The Incredible Hulk, starring Edward Norton, 2010's Clash of the Titans, and most recently 2013's Now You See Me in uh, you know, the, 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 the magic heist movie. Um, he's also done some work on Netflix. He, he worked on the Dark Crystal Age of Resistance the puppet series, and then he also worked on 2021's Lupin. Seems like a safe, safe pick, right. That's that. That's what he seems like. Which I guess is what you need at this point. You're you're a week into production. You don't want you don't want some crackerjack auteur coming in who's going to like change the game. You just want somebody who's going to shoot sc shoot the script and not ask a lot of questions. <laughs> but um, you know, I what a, what a, what a sore note for for the the epic conclusion, the two part conclusion of the Fast and Furious saga. 
Right. I wonder if he'll stick around for part two. I mean, he may just do one and bail. We we, we can only hope. <laughs> There's mm. no way. He's sure. got no other income. He's got no other income. Yeah, he's got no <laughs> other choice. Um, any I don't know any any general thoughts on this one before we move on. I I, I don't have much more I, to say than what I've. I think I'm pretty. Re- I'm ready to move on. I don't know Stacey, how they're still making these. Uh, Honestly, I don't know yeah. how they're making money. What is the formula here? If not Vin Diesel, I, I don't know. Yeah, well, family. Like, they just, family. well, they make family. so much money. They're just wild action movies at this this point. Oh, and like, they, they're they dumbly enter- entertaining because of that. They just have really wild action pieces and they get yeah. a lot of these top stars. They're laughably formulaic. Like it's, but it, it's it works, something else. apparently. Yep, yep. Everybody, everybody can't wait to see CGI Paul Walker roll up just off screen to the family meeting at the end to split a Corona with Vin Diesel uh, at the barbecue. Uh, it's you know my, more on Fast X as we find out uh, more about the film. I guess for now, apparently they're shooting uh, and they're doing their thing. So hopefully we can see some trailer footage sooner rather than later. We can talk about this exciting film more. Now, speaking of exciting movies, we need to talk about some real cinema here. All right, it's time to it's time to get serious. <laughs> <laughs> talk about a real a real movie uh i don't remember oh, andy you taking the summary for this one or unbearable way to mess up talent i'm gonna be honest i did uh, <laughs> uh i'll i'll have a go at it right. i rehearsed right. it at some thank, point thank you god that gives me some time to work out unbearable <laughs> it's hardest part uh, of the show I'm very excited to talk about this movie. Stacy's here to talk about this movie. Robert Eggers' newest feature following The Witch and the Lighthouse from 2019. Uh Andy's gonna take the summary on it. Andy, please take it away. The Northman. Uh, so like Zach said, this is the third movie from director Robert Eggers, best known for uh, The Witch. Uh, this is kind of an epic tale of revenge uh, starring Alexander Skarsgård as Amleth, the, the son of uh, a king played by Ethan Hawke. Um, in a very Hamlet-esque uh, plot, the kingdom is overthrown by the, the brother uh, Fjolnir, uh, played by Clay's Bang, and uh, he he then sets off on a mission. He escapes. Young Amleth escapes, uh, becomes a, a, like a warrior Viking. Comes back to exact revenge on his brother, save his mother, regain the kingdom that was stolen to him. Uh, it's a very kind of epic and classical plot, and so that's our, our general thing of what's going on. Um, and I won't get too much more into into plot deals right now, so. We'll start with Zach. What'd you think? Uh, so I wasn't sure what quite to expect from The Northman. I'm a big fan of The Witch, Robert Eggers' first film, and The Lighthouse I liked even more. Obviously, those are two very different films to this one. Lighthouse is like a four by three black and white picture. <laughs> Uh, but th- this is a historical thriller, very action oriented. And I figured I'd seen the trailer a million times. I knew I knew it was coming. The trailer kind of feels like it has the whole plot in it. But I was excited to see. So I went in with relatively low expectations, pretty modest. And for the most part, I think I was pleased. Uh, I, there's a lot more. To, there's a bit more to it than what's shown in the trailer. Thank God. I was I was a little worried. I'd seen that trailer so many times. And, and I was pleased to find that there's a bit more, uh, especially in the action and violence department. <laughs> which was really, really good stuff to see on the big screen, especially with the fun group of folks. Uh, Stacy, what do you think of the Northman? Uh, I came into it with a bit more background uh, because I've been reading into Viking history. um, So when I found some some murmurings online of this being the definitive Viking movie, that wasn't said by Robert Eggers, but he said, hey, if I can take that title, I'll I'll do it. So I was like, well, let me see what's going on here. Did some research into Viking history, Norse mythology. um, Actually found that the origins of Hamlet are from a Scandinavian story. called mm. Amleth. So our our main character's name, it's a direct tie-in to that, uh, that saga that was adapted and then turned into Shakespeare's Hamlet. Um, so I, I started looking for the overlaps, and that's really what I was uh, watching for. And going into it, I was just loved it. I, I looked at some reviews afterwards of people who wanted to see more of the TV series that, that they had grown accustomed to a lot of the Hollywood adaptations and um, it, I guess interpretations and appropriations of, of Viking that we all have had hammered into our heads. But this took a different route uh, and really had a lot of uh, historical accuracies and brought to life a lot of the mythology 
uh, which I thought was a really interesting way to, to build this out. That's a very impressive intro. Sorry, I was waiting for Andy to jump in. <laughs> oh, but, yeah. oh my gosh, I was you, you, came, you came in with hot trivia. You did your research and is very synced. Well done, Stacy. I'm like, okay, you're you're gonna get invited back on the show. Andy, what do you think of the Northland? <laughs> Uh, so I thought a lot of this worked really well, and then some of it less so. Uh, I think one of the things Robert Eggers does th the best is setting um, in the witch. Obviously, the, this old New England tale, um, very great, good setting, but as well as the lighthouse. I mean, they actually built a, a lighthouse for them to make this movie, and they they research all this like 1890s uh wiki slang and they use those lenses from from the 30s to to recreate like the image um and so he does that again here where we're we're really taken into the world remind me a lot of braveheart even though braveheart's very historically inaccurate um but but of like really putting you in that setting like the makeup the the costuming like there's there's lots of little like villages that they had to build and and create and they're like dirty and everyone's got mud on them and so that much the setting is really good and that helps really bring you into the the picture i wanted a little bit more of like kind of character development or like themes and things like that but it's not really that kind of movie and i keep comparing this to like a lot of classics of antiquity things like the iliad the odyssey oedipus rex where you have like hero villain fate gods monsters these different kinds of just archetypes and that's what this feels like feels like a modern day myth yeah i think uh stacy's immediate comparison to the works of hamlet are pretty spot on especially if you've seen the trailer right you've heard that line over and over and over again i will avenge you father i will save you i will kill you for whatever kill you phone will save you mother <laughs> here i am flubbing it it's talking about how easy it is to remember but uh fortunately like the plot does feel a lot like a stage play and in the same way, like it holds its characters kind of at arm's length. It's it's almost like they're on stage just out of reach. You never really get inside folks' head and heads, and they're pretty basic. You don't expect your 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 Viking warriors to be all that thoughtful, and they're not. And like in a way, that's that's kind of cool because it makes it feel really authentic. Um, our our lead Alexander Skarsgård plays Amleth, uh, the prince, and he is not dumb. But he's very, he's very like dedicated to he's his a, cause. He's a hammer. Like his man. Looking yeah, for a he's, nail. He's, he's got one job and it's revenge time, baby. Like that's what's going on. And I like that the movie sets that sets that kind of right up from the front. Like they your your first act rolls through pretty quick, and before you know it, you're you're into the revenge plot of the story. As as you could expect in the trailer, it gives it away pretty quickly. Um, and I like that. And I like that it really stays focused on it and doesn't really waste a lot of time with B plots or C plots. It's pretty dedicated to, hey, there's this guy who's headed north to do some do some dirty work. That's what's going on. Uh, and and I, I I like I like that commitment to vision. That's a very Eggers thing. I, I do wish that they gave a little more of the interim. What happened between young Amleth and then all of a sudden this like big muscular full-grown man Amleth like I would have loved to seen a little bit more about his interactions as he's becoming a man um, but to your to your point about you know he's not dumb but you know he, he's really sticking to the story I kind of love that because um, Amleth it, uh, at the root of it means fool um, so wow. it's kind of like he's not dumb, but he's a fool of passion, right? He thinks he's doing the right thing by uh, having this family duty and, and avenging his father. Um, meanwhile, he, before that, like forgets about it for years, becomes this uh, berserker Viking warrior, and he's committing murder. But in his mind, that's like justified good murder, whereas the murder that took out his father is like bad murder. Um, so there, there's all of these things like he, he's actually a, a cunning, smart character, but at the same time, he does all these foolish things. And <laughs> the most direct uh, scene that he does it is when he's a slave over in, uh, in Iceland with uh, Fjolnir. And he just kind of has this outburst while he's in chains. I don't know if you remember, but um, he was about to be sent off to a, a different land. And he's just like, no, 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 no. And like, oh, this one's stupid enough. We can we can keep this one. Um, so he's cunning enough to act the fool, uh, but he has the long play in mind while he's doing it. Uh, that that kind of reminds me of a, a couple of 
plot points that I think are important. Uh, first of all, this movie kind of feels like Acts 1 and 2 are kind of swapped. Usually Act 2 is when you have a lot of action um, and kind of fun in games. In this one, it's almost the opposite, where Act 1 is like pedal to the metal. There's just like battle and fighting and lots going on all, all at once. And then Act 2 actually slows down. And in kind of, I, I think, what um, kind of upsets expectations, uh, he doesn't go on like uh this tear of like let me take over this village and this village and that and eventually i'm gonna get to the big boss and um he actually he ends up fighting fjolnir pretty early on uh but has to disguise himself like they said as, as a slave on this they're, they're essentially glorified like like sheep farmers um and they they have a few servants uh slash slaves and he just kind of has to blend in and then plan his revenge from there. So it's very different from how kind of the, the trailer makes it out to be and, and how the kind of normal revenge film would be. Yeah, it, 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 it I'm not going to say the movie feels lopsided because it doesn't. The, the next movie we're going to talk about actually feels a little lopsided, but this does feel like I feel like the trailer sets you up to believe it's going to be one long. How long is this movie? Two and a half hours, two hours and change. Something like L- that. A little over two. It makes it feel like it's going to be one long epic of a quest of a journey to make it from wherever Amleth is as an adult to where his uncle is to save him. He's rowing a boat and he's climbing a mountain. Believe it or not, like that actually happens pretty quickly. And then the next half of it is a bit more grounded. Yeah, it's it's mostly takes place at this property, at this location, at this farmland, at this kind of what village or township or whatever it is they've got. Um, and you're getting most of your adventuring around there. So it's not so much like Fellowship of the Ring as it is like, I don't know, Two, two Towers. That That's a horrible, horrible metaphor. But regarding like him being a Viking berserker and, and, and kind of the general moving of towns to towns, there's an awful lot of violence in this movie. And uh, it's pretty... <laughs> pretty visceral sorry already for sure um and i i thought it was interesting how this movie can be so brutalistic and it's got a really interesting angle on who's who violence is being committed upon in the movie whether that be men or women or children or old people like uh, it kind of shies away from some of some of the darker parts of being a viking and amleth has has a unique rule set for himself he's like well i'd never heard a woman and it's like okay all right people are squirming in their seats listening to this like i don't know buddy you're a viking but i can appreciate that egress tries tries to walk that line like i think it keeps your character simple and characters being simple doesn't doesn't a bad movie make you can have a really good movie with like pretty simple individuals uh and and i think this movie handles that well let's talk about our cast mm, yeah where do you want to start i guess probably early uh, we'll, we'll re- read off the big names uh alexander skarsgård uh nicole kidman plays uh the queen gudrun uh ethan hawk is the king anya taylor joy who shows about halfway through the film is also kind of in this enslaved uh situation uh is Olga, and then we have some very small roles by Will, Willem Dafoe and Bjork, who this is the first film she's been in in like twenty years, or Bjork, or something. Um, re- I, I thought re- really good performances all around. Of course, Alexander Skarsgård has got a he kind of holds everything, and you know had to get super ripped for the role. Does a whole lot of grunting. Like there's so much like ah, oh, oh dude ah, throughout like the whole film. Like they must have gotten hoarse. Um, He's holding everything in his traps the whole time. He's yeah, carrying the weight of the. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, but but good performances all uh, all around. Uh, Stacy, what do you think? I uh, completely agree. I was completely taken in by Alexander Skarsgård. I can't believe the transformation that he made for the movie. I was like. Oh, I didn't know he looked like that under his clothes. Fascinating. Um, I absolutely love Anya Taylor-Joy. I think she's just such a beautiful, delicate character. And to see her in uh, a role where she has those beautiful, delicate characteristics, but she's also this sorceress, right? At the end, you see she can summon the the wind. And uh, in the the scene where there are slaves in the, on the sheep farm, she's able to summon the earth and get these mushrooms um, so I think that's this beautiful balance of like the delicate, but also really powerful. Like you wouldn't want to cross this woman. Um, yeah, I, I was really hoping she'd be in the film a little bit more than she is. I feel like that's every movie I see on Taylor Joanne. I'm like, could, could she just be the main character if we get more of her, please? 
um yeah everybody in this film was a lot of fun uh, a special mention for nicole kidman uh who does not have a ton of scenes but she does the scenes she has pretty well uh i, I, was, I was very surprised to see her standing out in this movie and additionally our antagonist uh i don't know how to pronounce his name clay's bang uh i've never seen him in anything he's super good in this like very menacing mm-hmm. uh seems uniquely thoughtful uh <laughs> <laughs> not too shabby ethan hawk's cutting it up willem dafoe's cutting it up they're having a good time they, they know what movie they're in and and i'm and uh, yeah, Will, yeah willem dafoe is is this uh jester like character called uh, uh hey Mir the fool um and he he only has a couple of scenes and uh it's a shame because he's he's great he's fantastic um, i read somewhere they filmed more with him and then the studio had him cutting it for time or something they were like hey get through this first act a little faster and it's a shame because i could to- totally could use more willem defoe like he does not does not hurt the scenes at all i he was one of my favorite he's just he comes off as so manic and even in in his name uh the fool is used but you can see in his rhetoric and some of the things that he says and even uh, in the, the the spell that he leads uh, Amleth and his father through, he's very intelligent. He has a lot of power, and yet he's this jester. Um, so again, there's just kind of that contrasting theme that keeps popping up throughout the uh, the movie that I really love. Mm-hmm. Uh, a quick question for y'all, since we're starting to wrap this up, I think. Uh, you, you know, I, I read somewhere that this. An earlier review of the Northman said that it's it sure feels like Rob, uh, Robert Eggers' movie, but it, but if he had two hundred million dollars to spend instead of like twenty million or whatever he said spend on his last two films, uh, what do you guys think of that? Because because in in a way I think that's true. It definitely feels like it's it's more Robert Eggers with a way bigger budget, but uniquely I think he it feels smaller somehow. I think than two hundred two hundred million dollars. Like it doesn't it doesn't feel like Godzilla versus Kong. It feels very epic and grand, but intimate. And like, I don't think that's easy to do. Yeah, I, I do feel that he, this is a much bigger budget. I think it was 40, 50 million, something like that. Um, his other films were much smaller, of course. I, I do feel like he played it a little safe. Um, you know, what I love about his other two films are kind of the themes and characters that he develops, which is very like deep and philosophical. And there's a lot going on. And I feel like he just played a little bit closer to the surface with this one. Wanted to be sure to get like, you know, the action scenes are great and like the setting and the Viking stuff. Uh, so I, I feel like he kind of is holding back on the script a little bit on this one. And so I'd like to see something that's kind of a better balance between things like the witch and the lighthouse and this. Yeah. I think it's, I, I've got to say, I, I don't know how much of the budget went into the, uh, the magic scenes. I kind of wish some of that was more unseen, <laughs> uh, you know, with like the tree of life and, and uh, some of that stuff. Um, but I, I like that it has this simplistic flow. And in some cases, there's like a single camera and it's just a long shot um, as opposed to having multiple cameras and multiple points of view of what's happening. Um, Again, it kind of just takes you to a different place where people are, a lot of folks in the reviews that I've seen are going and expecting a certain formula. And he's intentionally breaking that. And in a lot of cases, making this more of an introspective type of thing, again, playing on that Amleth, Hamlet, uh, type of, of nod to, to the past. Um, but I like it. it. It was something that I wasn't expecting. Uh, there's a lot of things I wasn't expecting in that movie, you know, speaking of Nicole Kidman, <laughs> her scene. Uh, but I maybe I'm just biased because I enjoyed it a lot. I, I don't know how he spent that much on the budget. Maybe it was travel budget uh, or keeping <laughs> Anya Taylor-Joy's feet warm between, <laughs> you know, takes where she was barefoot the entire time. Uh, but I thought it was a uh, well put together. Yeah, I, I, I felt the same way. Uh, a lot of fun, <laughs> surprisingly grim. Uh, the Northman. Everybody ready for final reviews? Any other thoughts before uh, recommendations? I'm ready. I'm ready. I think I'm ready. All right. Uh, let's start with Andy. Would you recommend The Northman? Yeah, I would. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, great action. Good setting. It. Uh, Rod, I keep want to say Roger Eggers. Robert Eggers uh, is one of kind of cur- the current exciting new directors of the last five years. Uh, so you definitely want to catch this. Great performances all around. A little simplistic in the plot uh, for me, but overall really enjoyed it. Stacy, I would say whether or not I recommend this really depends on what type of movie you like. If you are more in the camp of... Um, 
Fast and the Furious, and you really just want something that's hard hitting, easy to digest, really formulaic. If you're expecting something from the TV shows of a similar nature, this might not be for you. Uh, but if you are into serious cinema, if you liked The Witch, um, 100% go see this. It's so much fun. Uh, if you're into uh, history and literature, you're a bit of a nerd like I am, again, go see it because it's a ton of fun. And you're going to pick up on all the uh, the crossovers from from history and literature as well. Yeah, I think I'm pretty firmly in the same camp. I'd recommend this movie. Uh, I do have trouble figuring out who to recommend it to. It's pretty grisly. Like, you, <laughs> yeah, it is. you definitely you definitely got to be ready for that. Like, I don't, I don't know if this is a great date night flick, uh, unless your date <laughs> is definitely down for a little bloodshed because it happens. Uh, but, you know, you need, I don't know, you need something to take your dad to or like hang out with your friends who are totally down for this stuff or somebody who wants some good old fashioned lore because there's plenty of it. The Northman doesn't disappoint. It's a lot of fun. Would recommend. I'm so I'm so reckless with my recommendations. I'm like, yeah, everyone totally. Gets. Everybody. Yes. Yeah. Take your kids. Everybody should go see the Northman. Post um, yeah. I, I wanted to add one last thing. So, so yeah. you know, several of us went in Viking, full Viking makeup to, to the screening. And then afterwards, right. we, we went to a, a restaurant and bar, bar, like still in our, our makeup uh, and had a lot of fun looks uh, that time. Well, good, that good, rocks. Good, yeah. Good time. God, so yeah, the recommendation there is if you're going to see it go in costume because yeah. it makes it better yeah mm -hmm. yeah please do uh with that we should move on to our middle segment uh andy you want to introduce us for us it's time for the death of cinema so we haven't done death of cinema in a long time a lot to catch up on uh two huge pieces of news uh the first of which is that netflix on their latest earnings call announced that they had had a two hundred thousand. They lost 200,000 subscribers in, in the previous quarter, um, which tanked their stock. And they, they anticipated as many as losing 2 million by the next quarter. So things really shaking up over at Netflix. They're going to cut back on a lot of the spending, a lot of the, the production stuff. And theaters are overjoyed about this, um, which brings us to CinemaCon, which was a big ex exhibition in Las Vegas uh, for theater owners and exhibition exhibitionists, um, where there was lots of new footage and new announcements about uh, upcoming uh, new things. So that's kind of what, what we're going to be getting into. Uh, Zach, uh, take it away. Oh, gosh. A double helping of Death of Cinema. This is what I get for taking last week off. Lots of big things happen at the movies, which is good. I guess we'll start with Netflix, right? We'll start with a little bit of the doom and gloom. Uh, maybe if you're at least a Netflix subscriber. But, uh, you know, it is it is what it says in the tin. Uh, Netflix is losing subscribers, which is not great. It's not, not, not exactly a known thing to happen for Netflix. Typically, they gain subscribers. So... Them taking a dip is not good, and it seems like their immediate response to this also is not very uh, oh, yeah. consumer friendly. Yeah, uh, uh, since since this kind of happened, CEO Reed Hastings has been saying that they're looking at uh, limiting password sharing on the platform to increase revenue, so you can't we won't be able to share passwords as easily between households, family members, friends, even. And then additionally, uh, they're looking at, Oh God, what was the other practice they're going to do? I forget. Ad, ad supported ads. Yeah. Ads. Yes. Ads. That's <laughs> right. Thanks gang. Uh, ad yeah, supported tier. looking at adding an ad supported tier, which is not something Netflix has ever done, but they think that that might be something that some consumers would be interested in so they can make a little bit more money. I don't think anybody likes either of those ideas. I think everybody dislikes those. Yeah, that, uh, what do you not, guys think? That's not the issue. So they lost subscribers, but other services gained uh, subscribers. I think HBO Max gained two or three million, I was reading. So it's not necessarily streaming burnout as as much as theater owners wish it was. Um, mostly it's just the co most of the content is just trash. <laughs> like I'm at a point where I will not even watch a Netflix trailer because I'm like, oh, that's probably mediocre. I don't even bother with it anymore yeah <laughs> yeah i think they're pretty much just digging their own grave at this point they're not listening to the users asking what the users want they're trying to make some money moves which is just kind of the kiss of death at this point they're already losing subscribers so adding these practices of like cutting down on password sharing like okay you're gonna lose the rest of your users now um, based on some of these things it's it's they're just silly. gonna pirate yeah, yeah. 
they don't netflix doesn't seem to have a very what's the best way to say this i, I think they have a content forward strategy right they want to constantly put be putting out new content new series new movies new tv shows uh for their audiences to consume but they don't seem to believe in investing in the ones they already have and they don't do a good job of promoting anything over anything else like it's just kind of a wash on the site you think of like hbo and they have their like star series they have their stuff up front that's going to be popular think of apple tv plus they've got the same thing Hulu kind of does it not super well. Amazon's a bit of a wash, but like at least you know when you go to HBO's homepage, you're going to see like Barry and you're going to see Insecure and you're going to see Euphoria. And if you go to Amazon Prime's homepage, you're going to see their Lord of the Rings series they're working on and and whatever else Amazon Prime has going. Netflix, I feel like they don't they don't do a good job of really like curating the stuff that works. They kind of just throw it at the wall and then blow it out after two seasons and it doesn't keep people around for long because you don't get a lot of you know consumer investment yeah i was i was listening to a a different podcast uh where they were talking about this exact thing and they were saying things like amc has you know five five and six seasons of breaking bad or they're on season six of better call saul and so they do a better job of really investing in in a property and in a brand really going for it and netflix is just like churn and burn yeah, and it takes a long time to get around on stuff too. Like we just got a trailer for season four of Stranger Things. Didn't Stranger Things start like eight years ago. Like what's yeah. taking so long? Um, you know, I, I I don't I don't know. I, I think I think there's more Netflix could be doing on the content side, and maybe they're trying to work that out. But yeah, announcements of we're going to add ads and stop letting you share passwords is not not helping their cause. You know, Netflix is is quickly approaching the streaming chopping block. For me, they're probably right behind Hulu. Like of and maybe maybe even worse than Hulu. I might I might lose them first if I gotta cut one. I, I don't know. At least Hulu has a, a good true crime selection. I, I keep them around for that right now. Yeah. Like Hulu's got some decent <laughs> picks on there. I, I don't mind them. Uh Netflix is just a bit of a, a bit all over the place. Yeah. It's mediocre, mm. I think. But hey, they have Jackass 4.5 coming on May 20th, so that's exciting. <laughs> yeah, tune into Netflix for Jackass 4.5. God, how much do they have to pay to get that away from Paramount, right? Like, I'm sure that's a chunk of change, because uh, that's where that should be, Paramount Plus, but, you know, whatever. Maybe it's a hard sell, I think. <sighs> yeah, uh, and you're right, Andy. Like, it, it is. It, they are uniquely positioned because they are one of a handful of services uh, that seems to be doing poorly when others are doing well. So hopefully they'll shape up it. But meanwhile, CinemaCon happened and a lot of people are excited about that. I'm going to be honest. I was in a, I was in a state with not a lot of internet and I'd missed a lot of these announcements. I'm hoping Andy can, can, can refresh my memory. Right. They, there was a ton and they, they showed like uh, there were some premieres. There was, they premiered some trailers. Some of these hit the internet. Most of it has not. It's been kept very private, uh, but some of the big, announcements uh the sequel to the 2009 james cameron vehicle avatar was announced uh it's called avatar the way of water and it's coming uh december 16th um if you don't know it's the first of four announced sequels so some of they really believe in this um they've also you know like built avatar world or they're going to build avatar world uh at the whoever owns it disney and uh so that's part of the reason they're doing these movies uh some some Uh other announcements uh the next mission impossible mission impossible seven dead reckoning part one so this is seven and eight are going to be a two-parter that's a great title but all but kind of a a little long um a couple of other big announcements the batman 2 or the sequel to uh matt reeves the batman was announced ghostbusters 2 sequel to ghostbusters afterlife and then venom 3 uh also announced so ton of new announcements Yes, lots of twos, lots of threes, uh, maybe even a four in Avatar's case. And for for those interested, remember that Disney's plan is to stagger Star Wars and Avatar movies every December for the next eight years. We'll get an Avatar movie one December, and the next December we'll get a Star Wars movie. And December after that, so on and so forth. Andy's right. It's because they have Avatar Land, which is funny because I'm convinced the only reason they own that is because Universal was getting Harry Potter Land in like 2014 and they panicked because they weren't getting the rights and felt like they had to buy another big movie property and they stumbled into Avatar. Uh, Either way, more is coming uh, and that's all we know so far. I heard Top Gun Maverick played great. Supposedly that was like actually really well received. I know things are probably usually really really well received at CinemaCon, but hey maybe that screening won't be so bad maybe i haven't seen the entire film in the 18 trailers that have been published since 2019 huh 
This one uh, has baby goose in it, though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. Uh, sure does. Son, son of goose. Um, <laughs> Stacy, are you are you a Top Gun fan? How do you uh, feel about Top Gun? I can get down with the original. It's not one that I'll put on uh, my annual rotation. But I did have to kind of scoff at seeing that they're remaking this. It's like, can't you just leave the good things alone? I just, what are you going to do here? Money on the table. So they're they're really hoping for like a three hundred million domestic take on uh, Top Gun Maverick. The problem is it's playing to older audiences, which have been really uh, resistant to come back to the theaters. The big demographic that drives theater going now is like the eighteen to thirty four you know, young males, and Top Gun isn't that, and it doesn't play to that uh, thing. So it, I I'm like it look it looks like a good movie, but like if we weren't doing it for the show, like I wouldn't go watch it. Yeah, I think I I might skip it too. I'm curious to see how it does. I think it'll probably do well. I mean, it'll in fact, it'll probably it'll be really okay. well. Yeah. Uh, the uh, the I'm trying to think of a funny way to say a bunch of old people are going to go see it, but like ultimately, that's who I think is going to go see Top Gun Maverick, right? Like it's gonna it's gonna be some of the olds, and that's okay. Good for them. The Silver Tsunami, hard at work at the movie theater. <laughs> uh, ultimately, you know, some good announcements out of CinemaCon. Excited for Batman two. I don't know who the villain. I don't know who the villain's going to be in that, but Loki. I hope it's Penguin and Mister Freeze. They're they're approaching December in Gotham, and it's full of water. Be real easy for that to freeze over. Get some good good old fashioned comic book stuff, but we'll see. Yeah, I um, think the, the the big takeaway, yeah, uh, the big takeaway from the week was that you know theaters are recovering they're doing better and streaming is taking a bit of a hit because of netflix the theater the theater owners are running with that they're like streaming's dead theaters are back you know it's like well not, not exactly but um things are looking better for for theaters and there's a lot of you know exciting uh, things on the way by the way the trailer for avatar 2 will go in front of dr strange so that'll be like in just a couple of days very interested to see I just don't. I tell you, I saw some leak. I don't know if you saw those leaked photos that made it onto Reddit. A couple screen caps from CinemaCon. Uh, it just looks like more Avatar. <laughs> like it doesn't. I don't know what I expected. I guess I expected some kind of technological leap or something. At least in like bringing the, the, 3D back, baby. Yeah, at least in the blurry photos I saw on the internet, I was like, this sure looks like Avatar. So we'll see. Like, who knows? Maybe, maybe it'll be the new hotness. Is James Cameron? Man's got a track record of making good movies. I don't know. Maybe it'll be great. But I just, you know, I, I got to see this trailer. We, I, the whole the world needs to see this trailer. Yeah. It's time. Uh, Stacy, are are you excited for any of these announcements? Any of these sequels? Anything? <laughs> it's okay if the answer is no. No. Anything ringing your bell, Stacy? None of these are ringing my bell. I'm I'm a little disappointed. There's uh there's a couple couple movies coming up that aren't mentioned in CinemaCon, uh like the A24 movie uh, Men that's coming out. So there, there's a couple yeah. in the horror genre that I'm looking forward to, but gosh, Disney is just not doing it for me these days. Um, and most of these look like they're funded by Disney. Yeah. The, the, the house of mouse knows no bounds. Well, and what, what's uh, happened the, because of the pandemic and other things is like only like the biggest budget, biggest tent poles are going to theaters. And a lot of where we've kind of lost out on the mid budget film has kind of disappeared and, or it goes straight to, to streaming. So yeah, it's interesting what, what brings people out. Yeah. It sure is. And, uh, you know, if you want to keep up with what's going on at the movies or CinemaCon or any of these exciting movie announcements, keep it here on Off Script for more. With that, we should probably move into the unbearable weight of massive talent. But first, we need to wish a heartfelt goodbye to our guest, <laughs> Stacy. Stacy, thanks for hanging out. I appreciate it. You got to come back sometime. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. And next yeah. time we catch a screening, we'll, we'll all go in costume. We'll plan it ahead of time. <laughs> tell, your, tell your friends to subscribe. Take their phones from them and subscribe to the show on, on our behalf. Follow <laughs> here. Yeah. I'm totally That's guilty right. of that. I'll plug yeah, that. Follow, yeah. Follow off script for more. Awesome. Well, Stacey, thanks for hanging out. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll, get, we'll get on to our review. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Have a good night. All right. We'll see you. All right, Andy. It's just the two of us. Let's jump into it. I'm going to be taking the summary on this. So please excuse my clumsy delivery. The movie is the unbearable weight of massive talent. 
So, The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent is the story of Nick Cage, the legendary actor, or at least kind of a fictionalized version of him. Uh, Nick Cage is reaching a late stage in his career, and he's got a young daughter who's growing up and a wife who's currently getting a divorce from, and uh, he decides that he thinks he might want to take a break from acting for a while, but then he gets an offer to come out to a billionaire's mansion out in the sunny coast of somewhere uh tuscany i think uh where he's paid a million dollars to hang out with pedro pascal's character uh who is this eccentric billionaire who's a tremendous fan of nick cage uh and and just you know maybe 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 discover a little bit about himself but upon exiting the plane for this sunny villa he meets with a cia op uh played by tiffany haddish who tells him that pedro pascal's not all who he seems to be and suddenly nick cage is torn between a super fan and a cia sting operation uh it is an action comedy starring nicholas cage it is in theaters right now the movie is the unbearable weight of massive talent andy what'd you think uh so this was all right. Uh, I had a good time. There are a, a lot of laughs. There's a lot of good in jokes. Um, but it didn't qu quite go as overboard as I was hoping. Like for, for it being about Nick Cage, he wasn't very Nick Cage, which is known for being these kind of over the top performances or these really classic action scenes. Uh, it's kind of watered down. And so much so that like this movie could have, you could just have generic, you know, uh, watch our aging film star looks to reignite career like that's it, you could have swapped in kind of anyone that, that that's a big name in this and so that's that's unfortunate uh the first kind of half of the, the film is better than the last half we we kind of devolve into a bunch of action setups that aren't super fun or compelling and starts to drag pedro pascal is is really good as the kind of cage obsessed super fan uh he's a lot of fun and they them as like this uh buddy cop thing is a lot of fun as well so it, it was a good time i did laugh a lot there are a lot of good jokes but it's the kind of thing it's better definitely better in like a group of people yeah, the unbearable weight of massive talent is functionally a giant tribute to Nicolas Cage that also stands almost exclusively on his shoulders. Uh, I don't know if this would have worked with another actor or actress. I, I, I watched it with a buddy, and as we were walking out last night, I said, hey, do you think it would have worked with anybody else? And he was like, maybe like a Bruce Willis type, like some kind of action star is really generic. Maybe you could have done it that way. But Nick Cage is uniquely the talent that brings people to the theater and keeps them in the seats. Uh, he's pretty good in this movie. Uh, he's not quite full on, you know, wild Nick Cage. You get some good stuff for sure. Some some kind of glimmers and moments of 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 Cage that are solid. And it's good to see him kind of stretching on his comedy chops again. Lately, uh, the, the two big features I've seen him in are Mandy and Pig. Uh, also Color Up Space, which is all right. Um, so I'm, I'm glad to see him getting into a little bit of comedy again because he's good at it. Like Cage, Cage is a good comedy, is a good comic. I think he's got good, good sensibilities. Pedro Pascal, additionally, is kind of the super fans. A lot of fun. Uh, he's simple. He's a simple character. And I think Pascal knows it. So he, he plays him really solid. And yeah, otherwise, I mean, he, it's a pretty small cast. Otherwise, you don't have a whole lot else going on. That's pretty much where the budget went was those two. Yeah, I was going to say uh, Pascal. I mean, he kind of he nearly outshines Cage in his own movie. Uh, he's just really solid from from beginning to end. Yeah, uh, I I think the, the the film is like I said during our Northern review, uniquely lopsided. Uh, I think the trailer gives you basically the first half of the film, and then kind of the second half is just kind of this loose run into this kind of action thriller uh style film with a little bit more going on at the end, and and that stuff kind of uniquely doesn't work. I, I think the best parts of the movie are. Nick Cage and Pedro Pascal hanging out and that's kind of through our first two acts and then come the third it starts to get a little bit more serious I guess that's what you'd expect from kind of a a, a film that's a tribute to Nick Cage you're gonna need a little action and adventure at the end of it like you need a couple people getting out handguns or and whatnot but uh it feels a little a little tacked on and it feels a little out of place I, I think the movie kind of could have worked if they'd really just expanded that first half and ran with it but if you're watching with a group of friends and you're coming to see a, a Nick Cage movie star and Nick Cage doing Nick Cage stuff, like it kind of, you know, it checks the box, man. I can't say this movie doesn't do what it sets out to do. Like it definitely does. Uh, but it wasn't quite as the script wasn't quite as tight as I expected. I yeah, I, it didn't lean into it as much as I, I would have thought. I, I was expecting some huge over the top performances, you know, because 
Nick Cage is known for the, like these great monologues or these great parts where he's just like 150% kind of overacting. And we don't really get uh, any of that as much. And, you know, we, we get a lot of tributes to his older movies, but, but again, I think a big tribute would have been some really crazy uh, action scenes. And I, I'm reminded of something like hot fuzz, which is a parody of act of buddy cop action movies, but it itself is a really great buddy cop action movie. And so I was hoping we would kind of get more of a parody to something more over the top, more funny, more jokes. Just. Yeah. That's funny. The, the, the film I, 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 I kind of had definitely, definitely, I think I kind of had a thought of Hot Fuzz somewhere in here, but the movie I kept thinking about was Tropic Thunder. Um, you know, sorry, it's it's a movie about a bunch of actors and a comedy about a bunch of actors who uh, travel to a remote part of the world uh, to try, try to immerse themselves in a role and end up like taking part in a giant operation they didn't know. And it turns this whole comedy thing. Similar in tone, I think. Uh, also reminds me a little bit, in, in its finest moments, it reminded me a little bit of like a Charlie Kaufman script, almost like being John Malkovich or adaptation in that it's very meta. Like you're watching a movie about Nick Cage doing Nick Cage stuff and you kind of know it's a fictionalized version of him, but you can't help but like, you know, uh, understand that in the moment. And then our characters start talking about making their own movie in one scene. And then they're like, well, it should be this. And you're like, this is, this is, this is getting to be too much. And in its worst parts, it feels a bit like an SNL sketch. And, and I think that's okay. Because again, like the movie is, is just a, a vehicle for Nick Cage to be Nick Cage. I think the problem comes from um, probably its director. Uh, Tom Gormican has directed one other feature before this. It was a movie in 2014 called that awkward moment. And if you don't remember it, <laughs> it's because it wasn't a really big deal. Uh, he also directed some episodes of the show Ghosted in 2018. Other than that, this is his second feature film. Uh, and I, I, th- it kind of shows. Like, I, I think Pedro Pascal and Nick Gage are doing a lot of the heavy lifting on screen to keep things interesting. But I, it's got some continuity errors. There's definitely some problems with kind of like the general pacing. Uh that's where I think the biggest issue comes from. I, I think they just were a little limited in every other aspect outside of their spend to get Nick Cage and Pedro Pascal in this movie. Like that's, that's kind of, yeah. Yeah. There's, there's also kind of too much going on. There's a little bit of the kitchen sink issue where, you know, the premise of him coming out to, you know, to this guy's birthday party as a super fan and the awkwardness there, it's a great premise. But then like you introduce this whole kind of accent subplot where, you know, Tiffany Haddish is, is a CIA agent. They recruit Nick Cage to do CIA stuff. And it's, it's almost too many, just too many chefs in, in the kitchen. And I think the action CIA plot is what works the least about this. Yeah. Kind of. Um, yeah. The, the stuff that works the best is the kind of buddy comedy. The two of these guys hanging out and, and kind of being goofy Nick Cage fans together. Right. And talking about face off and con air. The movie features a bit of footage from those films, which is nice. Um, it's definitely got some props from other Nick Cage movies gone in 60 seconds. The chainsaw from Mandy shows up at one point, like for, for what it is, if you are a Nick Cage fan, I would be hard pressed to say there's a better tribute to the man than this movie. Like it's, it's really tremendous. But if you took Nick Cage out of it and you swapped out with another actor, I feel like it'd be a little middling. (laughs) Yeah. And that's, and that's okay. Right. Like that doesn't look, it's a, it's a comedy. It's, it's not trying to win an Oscar or anything. Well, uh, one of the things that I was reading that they uh, they actually covered up a number of uh, Nick Cage's tattoos because the the character is actually it's not Nick it's not Nick Cage it's again like we said a version of him which is, is kind of weird so but it it's like it's uh, it's a more tame watered down version I I guess which is it's kind of disappointing. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, like and, and that's that's an odd thing to see in the film. Like I've seen, you know, I, if you if you've made this far into our review, I, I'd assume you've at least seen a couple interviews with Nick Cage. You might have seen photos of him in public. He's a pretty wacky dude. And this movie is like a tame version of him. It's he's not quite that wacky here. He, he kind of reaches that peak at a couple points. But like, dude, he, he makes some unique outfit choices in his actual life. And those aren't really present here. So. I think that's okay. Yeah, I, I don't expect this to be, you know, like a, a, a biting documentary or anything, but uh, it, it is a little, it's a little challenging to get into. Yeah, at some point you you, you start to realize like this is kind of a, 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 a weak script with, with a strong actor wrapped around it. And that's not bad, but it's, you know, 
man, man, it is what it is. So still, still a few good laughs. I'll admit, like it's 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 funny in spots, definitely. But uh, you know, I think I think low expectations are required for a movie called The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent. Yeah, it, it, exactly. It, it's not. It doesn't pretend to be like some super deep or even hilarious movie. It does, it does look funny. It is funny. There are plenty, plenty of laughs. Passes the six laugh test. Um, yes. a, a lot of it only works in a group or in a like we we saw it in the you know fairly packed theater uh so it's one of those kind of funny films something you put on casually make a drinking game out of maybe that sort of thing yeah definitely andy any other thoughts for recommendations i'm ready andy would you recommend the unbearable weight of massive talent I would say save it for streaming uh, if you're a big Nick Cage fan or you're a Nick Cage completionist, which would be difficult. He's made over 100 films, which is incredible. Oh, yeah. That's um, wild. Yeah. So if you're if you're a fan, definitely check it out. It is a lot of fun. It's Like I said, I, it can wait for streaming if you're a little unsure. Um, definitely better in a group uh, if you are going to go to see it in the theater or, or with friends, but probably just wait for streaming yeah i i think i'm in the same boat like if you've got a bunch of buddies or friends you want to go see it with and y'all are all gonna get a laugh out of watching nick cage or nick cage stuff sure otherwise wait for streaming like you definitely do not it's nothing particularly theatrical about this experience if anything it'll probably better at home uh so yeah i don't i, I would bend over backwards to go see it or anything it's fine it's, it's fine I, I i like this movie fine i guess i i, I had hoped it'd be a little more I don't know. I hope I'd still be chewing on it a couple of days from now, but it's okay. I don't, I don't, I don't need my, my, my comedy script to get incredibly meta or anything. Like it's, 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 it's a good Nick Cage flick. I think it's a fine, it's a fine Nick Cage flick. That's what I think. And that's the unbearable weight of massive talent. Uh, Andy, what are we watching next week? Marvel baby. Marvel baby. <laughs> so uh, I guess this is only the second film in the, uh, Marvel Phase 4, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. Oh, uh, heavily anticipated. Definitely excited to go see. We have tickets to see thir this Thursday uh, in the evening. So we'll be on it. Hopefully get ahead of any spoilers. And we might watch something else. Well, not, there's not a lot new out now because it's we, we're officially hitting the summer blockbuster season. There's actually going to be a lot of in, in theater films. Uh, so we'll wait to see what streaming is. And because it's a big Marvel film, we might just do that one. That's right. Uh, typically on off script, we may reserve big, big, big Marvel films for one episode just because there can be a lot going on. And from what I hear, there might be a lot going on in Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. I've actually got plans to see it twice. Already. Oh, nice. I don't know how that happened. Yeah, I'm going Thursday uh, to get, get the early screening and hopefully get in before the spoilers. And then uh, Monday, I'm going to see it again. And I'm, I'm, I'm predicting that will be a two watch film, right? I think. I hope Good. I will not be bored and watch too. I, I hope it will be. I hope there's going to be a lot going on. So we'll see. Uh, but if you want to hear more about Doctor Strange and what we think, or you want to hear more about these movies that we talked about this week, if you want to keep up to date with your boys off script, maybe stay plugged into movie news, what's going on with Netflix or movie theaters or otherwise, keep it here on off script for more. You can follow us on Facebook where we live stream the show every single Tuesday. Uh, you can find us on Instagram or on YouTube where we upload our live streams or on Twitter where you know, we're on our usual podcast outlets. We're around and you can find our website at offscriptfilmreview.com. You can email us at mail at offscriptfilmreview.com for correspondence. Tell us what you thought of the show, the movies we watched, or maybe the movies we should watch. And most importantly, uh, if you want to help out your boys at Offscript, the biggest thing you can do is just subscribe. To subscribe, you get new episodes of Offscript delivered straight to your phone every single Tuesday as soon as we publish them. Uh, you can also leave us a rating and review. That's also helpful, uh, and that would be tremendous, whether that be for us or our wonderful guests or about the movies we talked about or whatever. The point is, we want to hear from you guys. So write into the show. Email us. Leave us a rating or review. Subscribe, and keep it here on Offscript for more. From all of us at Offscript, the home of Bold Cinema, I'm Zach Lewis. And I'm Dr. Draper. <laughs>